Welcome. My name is Keith Stewart. I'm a myeloma physician at the Mayo Clinic, and we're here in Boston at the Myeloma 2016 meeting where we've just completed our first day of sessions. I'm joined today by my colleague from the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Leif Berg Sagel, uh, by Professor Kenneth Anderson from Dana Farber Cancer Institute, and by Professor Sagar Lonio from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. It was a long day, uh, but we covered a lot of territory, and we started the day with probably the most exciting area in multiple myeloma and indeed in cancer research, which is the use of cellular immunotherapy. And maybe we'll start with you, Sagar. Tell us what was your takeaway from, from that session? Well, I mean, I think um, trying to find the ideal myeloma-specific antigen is something that a lot of the groups were talking about. Is it BCMA? Is it CD19? Are there other targets? I mean, I, at least from my sense, I think BCMA probably makes a lot of sense. And the question is, is it going to be a car or is it going to be a bite? And which, which is going to be the answer? And for the audience that may not be so familiar with those terms, do you just want to expand on what those are? Yeah, I mean, a CAR T cell is an antigen-specific cell that's been created from the patient's own uh, immune cells and given back as a part of cellular therapy. A bite, in many ways, is a bispecific antibody, so it can be an off-the-shelf combination that targets a specific antibody and CD3 to bring T cells to the target. And, and Dr. Anderson, you, your takeaways from that, there was some pretty exciting data looking at the chimeric antigen receptor T cells with BCMA as a target in myeloma specifically. Yeah. You know, I think BCMA is likely the same best target because it's uh, universally expressed and it's also selectively expressed. Um, the immune uh, potency really depletes many logs of tumor cells, so you want, as you, if you can, a selective antigen. The one thing I would say is in the children in which this has been done for leukemia with CD19 cars or in the adults, uh, persistence of the cells seems to correlate with a prolonged benefit. And in the adults in particular, in the experience we heard about today, either with CD19 cars for myeloma or more recently with BCMA cars, right. we really haven't had persistence. So the concept of combination immune approaches to try to allow for the persistence of those cells, I think, is the future. I was very impressed. Uh, 33 response rates, what I calculate, only 12 patients, but these were highly refractory patients with um, some toxicity, but really remarkable responses. But your impressions from this? Yeah, uh, no, I, I would have said the same thing. I think the toxicity is a little bit concerning, but it seems like they, they have a handle on it. Um, and I guess one thing that uh, I was interested to hear was that in one of the patients, there appeared to be antigen escape, where they, they, the tumor cells were, appeared to be selected for loss of the BCMA expression, suggesting that might be a problem in some patients. And, and I was taken, uh, we, we also talked about the, the CD19 as a target, which sort of suggests we're maybe aiming for stem cell eradication of myeloma cells. Any thoughts on that, uh, Ken? I think that was uh, some, a patient I actually cared for. Um, and, you know, it's very hard to know. I, I think that um, CD19 is not very much expressed, uh, except potentially on the stem cell. I think the mechanism whereby these cells work is really not known yet. Whether, in fact, the response is actually induced and whether there are neoantigens that are expressed, what's the character of the long-term immune response? Could you possibly be getting memory cells? I think that's all exciting and, and uh, ongoing research will really tell us not only what's the best, best target, but what is the mechanism. We heard others trying to select certain T cells to program against a given antigen, CD4, CD8, or others. So I think, or NK cells for that matter. Yeah. So it's still in its infancy, but um, very exciting yeah, indeed. I'm, I've even heard the suggestion that the, in that case, the target may not have been the tumor cell, but immunosuppressive B cells. Express the regulatory B cells. So we yeah. really, we really don't know. Yeah. So, so the last uh, talk in that session looked at bites, which are really off-the-shelf products, and it, not in the clinic yet, but certainly through animal studies. And it, what do you think about the prospects for those? Uh, side of? Well, I think the advantage of the bites is that they are off-the-shelf. So, um, if you talk about persistence of the cells being an issue with a CAR T cell, you can give a bite repeatedly to sort of try and get that long-term uh, drug exposure and drug level. 
Um, and so I think uh, from a practical perspective, it has some really attractive idea uh, concepts. I think the question that came up during the session about whether you actually activate T cells versus just uh, bring them un an, un an unactivated T cell to the party is really an important question, though. I want to fast forward to the first session of the afternoon, I, I think was on minimal residual disease test, well, second session was minimal residual disease testing, and sort of get your takeaways from that, and, and I want to follow that up with the session we had on can we cure myeloma, which I think were some of the highlights of the day, so what well, do you I think about MRD testing? I, I think uh, Dr. Arfaio gave a great talk today, and he talked about using a, a next generation flow cytometry approach and comparing it to a next generation sequencing approach, and showed that they're both very effective, and, and you can get down to very low levels of disease, less than one in a million cells. And when you did that, you really um, are able to prognosticate a patient's outcome uh, very clearly. And I think it's going to help us accelerate how we treat patients or advance and make a cure. Thoughts on that? that uh... Yeah, I totally agree. I think that um, MRD uh, is a reasonable target now for clinical protocols. I think that um, many of us, all of us, are part of a, a large effort now in our country to define um, what are the different methods to use to measure MRD. It does appear that one in a million uh, sensitivity is, is probably the threshold we should try for now. And then once we can uh, agree on methodology, then it's a question of how we can use MRD for two purposes. One is for regulatory approval. Right. So we can get a biomarker early that can tell us about outcome later and develop drugs more quickly on the one hand. So just and then to clarify, you mean FDA approvals based on this MRD testing instead of waiting three or four years right. for survival? We're a victim right. of our own success, uh, Keith, because we can't wait uh, any longer for PFS or OS because fortunately they're really being prolonged. And then the other use that we heard so much about for MRD is, is obviously the clinical use. Should we aim for MRD as a, a response criterion? Can we inform our therapy, perhaps stop maintenance, uh, was discussed in patients who are MRD negative. So I'll, I'll take the, a little bit of a devil's advocate view here. And I think the first endpoint is certainly really interesting, and that is, can we use MRD as a surrogate mm -hmm. regulatory endpoint? The second one I'm not so sure is ready for prime time yet, in the sense that what we may be doing is just figuring out a very fancy way to identify the hyperdiploid potential cure factor uh, subset of patients, but we don't really know anything about the people that are, that are MRD positive, and they may be enriched for high-risk myeloma. Well, we know that their outcomes are not going to be as good as standard risk. I don't know that we need a fancy test to do that. I think we need studies that randomize patients based on risk who are MRD positive to same therapy versus changing therapy to really see whether we can impact a positive patient in the long term. Yeah. yeah. What was very clear, I mean, what, what I find, continue to find uh, somewhat astonishing about the minimal residual disease testing is the magnitude of difference. I mean, these are all people in complete remission clinically, and yet there's a huge magnitude of difference. Um, Dr. Yvette Lezol from France showed just a dramatic uh, difference between having positivity or negativity, yeah. so clearly an important thing for the future. Yeah. That led us into a discussion about cure. Can we cure myeloma today? And we had certainly one speaker, Dr. Barogi, saying yes, he thought we were curing people already, and then I think some others with a more measured take on this. So I'd like to get your sense of that. And it was particularly, well, I'll come back to Dr. Palumbo in a second, but what do you think about that, uh, Dr. Berg? So are we curing myeloma today? I would agree that there's a fraction of patients that are cured, and I think there's a big question of, you know, is it 10% of patients? Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Barlogi said it was half the patients with good risk disease, which is a much bigger number. And so it, the truth is probably somewhere in between. Ken? Yeah, I think that um, if the definition of cure is that patients are growing old and dying of something else, in other words, it can be even a chronic situation, um, but not fatal, I do think we are. Um, I, I do think uh, that the interesting thing about the total therapy experience uh, from the University of Arkansas is the major change that occurred with the incorporation of novel agents, first bortezomib and subsequently lenalidomide, into the total therapy paradigm. That's where the real change came. And, and Sai, let's finish with you. Are we curing myeloma today? I think we are, and, and I, would, I would say I think uh, probably 10 years ago it was in that 10 to 15 percent number. I think with a defined modern treatment approach, we're probably a little bit better than that. 
But I think the use of antibodies are going to, I hope, really almost double that number, I think, if we do it right. And, and uh, maybe uh, somebody other than myself could summarize the sort of conclusion of how we should be treating myeloma today, because I think there was sort of consensus around, around that, or maybe I only pick them. Let me see if Dr. Anderson got the same vibe I did from the room. I think, I think, that, we, I think that the overwhelming message is novel targeted therapy should be in, utilized. Um, there was a strong argument for triplets uh, uh, therapies to be utilized as initial treatment. Um, I think that Dr. Barlogi in particular uh, stressed the need for a transplant still to be in the paradigm in the transplant candidate. And then consolidation and maintenance, again, incorporating novel therapies. I think, as Sager said, the um, monoclonal antibodies that are now approved in the later stages of myeloma will rapidly move up front and are likely, because it's a new, it's an immune therapy, it, it, it's a new modality for us, will likely transform um, our therapy paradigm and also outcome. I think your tweet said it all. What did Triplets I say? Triplets plus an antibody. Yeah, that was yeah. why I Pharma took away. Pharma needs to hurry up and catch yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> I heard uh, proteasome inhibitor IMID yeah. and a monoclonal antibody probably targeting CD38. And, and I did tweet that really we need pharma there with us because we all want to treat newly diagnosed patients and we've been slow to get there and it's, it seemed to me a consensus in the room and that was the, the way we wanted to go. Just one uh, last uh, thing I want to press on a bit from today which really struck me and it's, it's for physicians who might be watching this was Dr. Palumbo's conclusion that under treating myeloma was just the same as having high risk myeloma and that really resonated with me. And I, what do you think about that? Are we under-treating and, and therefore doing a lot of harm? Or? I think he made a compelling case that if, when you let the patients relapse that bad things can happen. And it's probably, it's probably more so for high-risk disease than for low-risk disease, but it may not even be a good thing for low-risk disease. Can you look a bit skeptical there? No, so. no, I, compl I completely agree with him. I, I, I think the, the, another major theme of this first session of our meeting was the genetic heterogeneity from the outset, which is further uh, progresses with underlies relapse and so what he's basically saying is we have these new novel agents we need to learn how to use them probably an image a proteasome inhibitor and an antibody but the time to use them is early on and and uh, not to under treat patients I think many of us have been saying this for a while and that mm -hmm. in many in many ideas um, myeloma is a genomically unstable bear and when you under treat it you're just poking the bear um, and asking for trouble well, that sounds like a good uh, analogy to end on. I just I hope you've, we've captured for you some of the excitement we felt today as we explored the science of myeloma and how that can inform our clinical uh, decision making. So thank you for listening.